You wonderful Marvels, welcome back to another episode with Dana and I. Um, I was just saying to Dana that um, Dana and I usually start, we usually have some conversation before we start our episode. So depending on what that conversation is, we come in really, really laughing or or just kind of giggling. But it's always laughing laughing. on some level. Yeah, yeah, it's really great. (laughs) Um, Hey, Dana. Uh, So you've shared this quite a bit. Mm-hmm. actually on our on our podcast but it's come up quite a, like a lot for me as i'm supporting different adults whose sensory systems who being in their body is so hard mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that they it's really kind of taken them out at the knees and it just made me think of like all the body work that you've done i i, I wonder if we can just talk about what body yeah, work is yeah. and where where the field is with this and and maybe what it can alleviate you know yeah you know i i started uh therapy way back in the 80s um you can do the math but uh and my uh mom had been in uh what's called bioenergetic body work mm-hmm. for a long time like I, I think part of my going into it was like oh yeah this is what you do because my mom had done it so many years um, and there's a sort of, there's a history behind it. There's a guy that had a uh, name Wilhelm Reich, who had some really good, interesting ideas about how energy movement uh, gets housed in the body and most specifically how it gets blocked. And he, he borrowed a lot from Asian medicine and a lot of things that were kind of seen as, oh yeah, of course that's a thing that the Western yeah. world didn't. Um, he kind of went off the deep end as a lot of kind of genius people do and ended up being prisoned and he kind of got a little crazy there. Um, but he had a guy that was training under him named Alexander Lowen and Alexander Lowen, um, I think it was like in the late seventies when primal scream was a thing and so on, um, developed this type of therapy. Um, and there's a book, I, I, I don't think it's in print anymore, but you could probably find it, uh, that shows these various postures that you can do to sort of open parts of your body up that are, that are cut off. So the, the best way I can describe it to like a lay audience is, um, if you watch, like if you have a little baby or you have a, you own an animal, watch how they breathe. So they breathing actually is supposed, and yoga will teach you this. One of the first things they teach you in martial arts or when you go to do yoga or uh, relaxation is how to belly breathe, right? Your diaphragm is supposed to lower. That's what pulls air into your lungs. And then when you breathe out, your stomach should go down. A lot of Western cultures, especially for women, it's all about, you know, holding your stomach in and looking thin. And then if you are in a meeting sometime, just look around the room and watch how all these sort of socialize people to cut off their breathing breathe it's all like chest breathing and they're not taking breath deep into their bellies so this basic idea of even something as vital as a life breath being curtailed is kind of one example of how our bodies can over time um lowen talked about it as armoring so uh where all of us tend to hold stress in certain parts of our body um I personally think some of the meaning they put on the various parts was a little bit mechanistic and it was a little bit like, oh, I, you hold it in your throat. This is, must be what happened to you. That stuff's kind of ridiculous. But I do think that um, places that you hold tension in your body are, are sort of how you do yourself, right? So body work is predicated on this idea of things that happened to you growing up or traumas or chronic stressors you hold somehow like with muscle tension or like not breathing or other parts of your body that you sort of cut off from. So body work is meant to, uh, it's really what we call an abreactive tool, meaning it's a tool that we can use in therapy to access feelings. So there's all kinds of things. You can talk to someone and say, how do you feel? And they can tell you how they feel. Um, You can do uh, something like body work where it's not hands-on, but there are these, what, Lowen calls these grounding positions. And he did a lot of studying with indigenous folks in uh, Nepal and areas around there 
they would do these things called sun salutes. Probably people that do yoga will know what that looks mm -hmm. like. It was basically these stances that having your feet flat on the ground and really feeling like your center or what martial arts calls your hara being in the middle. So like if, if someone were to come by you and try to push you over, you're, you're grounded. That's the reason they call it grounding versus like soldiers who are taught to stand with their feet together and their knees locked. It's actually pretty easy to knock them over because their knees are locked. Their center of gravity is really high. So borrowed a lot of these ideas of that grounding feeling. And so for me, that's the first things I did in therapy. My therapist taught me how to do some of these grounding positions. Um, I thought they were super weird. I thought these people are out of their mind. What the f Oh, there, there's going to be a bleep. Sorry. Uh, and I, then I did them like, all right, well, you know, I was like 21 I, and I was still like, you know, authority tell me what to do. And I'd be like, sure, how high should I jump? So I I'd do these. And then I would notice a difference. Like my voice would drop, my energy felt better, my anxiety would go down. So I was like, hmm, maybe there's something to that. So I kind of got by in doing that. Um, what you don't see a lot of now, but was probably a little bit more popular in the 70s and 80s was the type of body work that therapists would actually touch you. And there's so much worry about liability now and things like that. They, it's really hard to find. There are practitioners that still do that, but it's it's kind of harder to find because they can't get insured. As soon as you're going to lay a finger on someone, you know, the, the liability insurance won't cover it. For yeah. me, though, I did a lot of work with my therapist that um, we call mat work had a lot to do with if I came in and said my throat feels really tight or my, I can't breathe today, my chest is really tight even just soft touch to that area and I would access my feelings my feelings would come up and I would, you know, feel the feelings and, and do whatever was there. And then we would talk about it afterwards to kind of integrate it. So I learned enough of that and did that long enough that some of those things I'll do on my own now. And what I found is um, areas of my body that were, that always felt tense, like as long as I can remember to when I was doing that work, aren't, they don't carry that tension anymore. Right. I mean, from time to time they will. And then you learn your own dictionary. Like for me, if my asthma is acting up and I'm having trouble breathing, I'll always check in with myself and say, what am I afraid of right now? Because it's, it's like a barometer for me that's saying I'm unsafe with whatever's happening. Sometimes work stuff where I teach will trigger it. And I'll be like, I need to speak up. I need to say something. But that's what that means for me, not for everybody. Right. Yeah. So it really is this pulling awareness to your to your physical self, paying attention to areas that hurt or are tight, you know, and for our audience, for um, neurodivergent folks, myself included, I think it's what really helped me with interoception cues and being aware of those because I wasn't prior to that. I, mean, I think the first time my therapist asked me what's going on in your body right now, I started laughing. I'm like, I have no idea what you're asking me. And then she had to kind of guide me through head to toe. Does anything feel tight? And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't feel anything. You know, uh, and that was a problem. I don't feel anything. Uh, and then I was mad at her for a long time through those years because I would start to be aware of something and then it just hurt all the time. And I'm like, I liked it better when I couldn't feel stuff because this hurts. And she's like, yeah, I know, but keep going because it'll you'll get to the other side and then you get relief. And she was right. Um, but I think it's one of the things that's really helped me be aware of uh, the impact of my environment on my senses. And you and I were talking before we started, uh, my wife and I are big sports fans. We love women's sports. We were this weekend, the NCAA basketball, they had a, the Sweet 16. One of the regionals was in our city. So we went to go see that. So my wife is not neurodivergent, but she kind of has some sensitivities, traits like that. Sound is something that can get to her over time too. So we were there for about three and a half hours. It's very loud. You know, it was super fun. We had a great time. I ate enough popcorn to fill my entire body because I planned for that and I loved it. And then we came home. We were both pretty tired, you know, went to bed relatively early. The next day, I felt like I'd been hit by a truck on Sunday. I was so tired. It was sort of like this feeling of like um, if you're traveling somewhere and you haven't slept in four or five days or you've been in the car all day and you get like that weird body buzz feeling. And it was good for me because I haven't been in it with COVID and everything else. I haven't been in a setting like that in quite some time. So to feel my body like saying, what the hell? And I don't, it, I don't think it was like a body work thing that I hadn't done release some piece. I think it was a sensory thing that was like this sensory hangover 
right? Mm -hmm. So much input. Mm -hmm. I noticed maybe about a half an hour before we both decided to leave, I, I even said, I think I'm done. Um, and, you know, the tickets were expensive and we love sports. And for those of you that don't know, regionals aren't going to be in your city every year. Um, and my wife said, can we just stay till halftime? And I'm like, that's cool. Let's do it. You know, and then, but I could tell before that everything was like, oh, my God, it's too much. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to be going to a, a big conference in August that I've been to before. And I was testing out, I have, I have the eye buds, but I have the noise yeah. canceling ones. Yeah. Now, I haven't used them a lot. So I was testing them out last night and I was like, when I go into that convention hall, I'm definitely going to be wearing these when I go to this thing in August. Cause I want to see how different it is. Right. Um, so you talked about the lead in was folks that even like being out in the real world, it's just too much. And I do think we diff have different thresholds. We have different size buckets of sensory overload. Um, but I've also done a lot to keep that low in general, the clothes I wear, the foods I eat, my routines, all that stuff I've given myself permission to do so that I'm not filling my bucket up with that stuff every day. And I think every person has to learn based on their sensory input and their body, what do they have control over lowering the bucket and what don't they, right? So for me, all those years of body work took a ton of water out of my bucket, but that was also water in my bucket that was there from some childhood trauma and other stuff that I hadn't dealt with. So that emptying that has made it harder to fill my bucket. But even then, you know, I have my life set up and I have people in my life that will say, yes, that's fine for you to, I'll make my own dinner every night. My wife does, cause I eat same, pretty much the same stuff every day all the time. Um, and I, I have permission to do that. You know, I've given myself permission to do that, but that's also being aware of, of my, what my body can handle. And that this weekend with being exposed to all that noise and stimulation and everything else is a really good example of, oh my God, if I had to go to a job every day that was like that, there'd be no way I'd be able to do it. If I came home every day with that sort of sensory overload, I would probably not have a job, you know? Yeah. So it's a real thing. I mean, I think that having to work with folks around what they can and cannot do. I also think it's one of the big reasons neurodivergent and neurotypical people alike, there's such a resistance to going back to the office five days a week after COVID. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's like, I feel so much better. I'm so much happier. I have so much less stress, right? So I think everybody yep. can, can relate to that on some level, depending on what that's there for them. Yeah, I, you know, it's like this hidden thing, right? Like it's mm -hmm. unseen. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then, you know, I've got, you know, these, uh, the, the clients that I'm thinking about are super bright, mm -hmm. highly verbal, Mm -hmm. And so you have these really, really articulate, um, witty, funny mm -hmm. uh, humans that other people think they're just trying to snow. You know, it's like, wait, oh. you, you can't leave your home. You like you, you can't get a job. You can't. Oh, I gotcha. And yeah, they're completely, yeah. you know, overwhelmed um, yeah. with the amount of effort it takes to be in the world. And a lot of times I, I do think that's a sensory thing. You know, I've got, I've got a lot, mm -hmm. I work a lot with like sound, you know, clients that have sound sensitivities and Dana, yeah. you know, you can get, um, custom ear plugs. Yeah. That you ear. can actually have them pour it in there. Like the yeah. musicians use. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can do that and they, you can, and then like you can get them in different in, in different levels or different mm. sound blockages. Um, but it's super discreet. Like you can stick yeah. those in your ear and, um, yeah, and, know. and those have been really great because it, it truly is very comfortable then, you know, oh, um, so yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's like something there, but you know, I, I just, you know, we, we did an episode on, on curing, right. Yeah. And yeah. The idea of, of body work, and so the idea of body work is there's blockages, you know, the, the word that came to my mind was chi, right? Like, like yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, there's these yeah. blockages of energy, right? And yeah. then you also have sensory integration types of, of interventions that are really meant to reduce 
or recalibrate the registration of the sensory system, whether that's on the auditory level or a tactile level, um, which is where we tend to see like hypersensitivity or over like being overwhelmed or, um, right, right. you know, by sensory information in those, in those areas. But, you know, these are things to explore mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if that's something where you're like, well, I use my whole bucket. Yeah. on just leaving my home to get cat litter. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I do think you that know. is the case for some folks because of how they're wired. I think it's probably the single biggest barrier to people um, staying employed. I'm employed. I have a private practice, but I wouldn't say that um, I'm at my job 40 hours a week. Right. I have have this flexibility. I can work on grading anytime I want on a laptop on in my couch in my house. And I think that's had a lot to do with it. I think back to times when I worked 40 hour weeks and thing, you know, like when I was a vet tech and I was on my field, I'm like, how did I do that? A, I was younger. (laughs) B, there was so much about that field that was so protocol driven and so routine driven that yes, I came home tired, but it was also, I didn't have to people a lot, you know, it was usually the vets that had to do the peopling, the techs are in back doing stuff and don't have to really talk to the general public all that much. So I think I probably gravitated toward the field that allowed me to have some of that. And I think that that becomes the, the key then is how can you find something that works for that person, um, whether it's not, 40 hours a week, or if it's a job they can do and have flexibility. And I know a lot of uh, ADHD folks, you know, ADHD Uh and autistic, who are like the night owl types. I've known a lot throughout the years that I've worked with that work in technology. And it's worked really well for them. They're like, oh, I work for Microsoft. They don't care what time I get the stuff coding done as long as it gets done. And I'm up between, you know, 11 at night and four in the morning. They don't care. And yep. that really, that has worked for them. And in hindsight, I'm like, oh yeah, that person was on the spectrum, that person, right? But they have found jobs and fields that allow some of that flexibility for them, right? Yeah, yeah. Project-based work really is, it's a really nice thing, um, I right. will say. Right. It's it, because yeah. I like how, I like how you use the word people, like, you know, you know mm. it's like as a verb, you know, you don't oh, need yeah. to people. Um, yeah. And that really is another area for that I see is taking up a lot of bandwidth, which is the social anxiety, right? The the true, like the true social anxiety. And and for those of you out there, social anxiety is really an anxiety about how you might be seen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Primarily you, you might anticipate in a negative way, uh, how someone might think about you um, or treat you or see you in a negative way. That's really the heart of social anxiety. Uh, that's very, I mean, I, I don't mean to yeah. oversimplify, but at the heart of it, that's what it is. And um, that in and of itself too. So we've just yeah. got, you know, a lot of bandwidth being used on things that we don't see, but you know, there's, 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 I think there is quite a bit of, of um, hope mm-hmm. in, in interventions and supports that have to do with the body and the sensory systems. Yeah. Yeah. I think as we learn more about it and more people mm-hmm. say, oh yeah, this is actually a neurological difference, then uh, there's more buy-in to give adaptations for it, I think, for sure. Yeah. 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 For sure. You know, so if you're listening out there, um, you know, it, this might just be a cue to attend to your body. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Sometimes yeah, things like if you ask your boss if you you hate socks and they say you have to wear socks to work, talk to them about why you need to not do that. Yeah. Right? I mean, I've had so many people who are like, "Oh yeah, my boss was pissed at me because I wanted to wear sandals." And I was like, "Why do I wear sandals? Cuz I don't want to wear socks." Um the the um that person finally did talk to their boss and then the go between was where don't wear open toed shoes, but you don't have to wear socks. And it wasn't ideal because like wearing dress shoes with no socks kind of sucks. Right. Yeah. But it was better. And then uh, that person being able to be when they're at their desk, they can do whatever they want. So that person would take their shoes off when they were at their desk. So it, it sounds silly, but those little things do add up the other way. Those little, those things help you empty your bucket. 
Yeah. Uh, wearing pre predictable clothing, having things to eat and drink at work that are predictable. Uh, my students will, uh, will be silly with each other. Even though I'm lecturing every week, I'm clearly being stared at for the whole time. I've gotten used to that. But when they're doing group presentations, I go to the back row. It's like, why do I do that? I don't want to be constantly aware that there are people behind me. There's like this felt sense that feels draining. And mm -hmm. so I want to focus on their presentation. I'm going to sit all the way in back. And then I just tell them, I don't want to be intimidating by sitting in the front row, like staring at you. But part of it is also taking care of myself on a sensory level. I'll always seek out a chair in the room that I know is going to be comfortable because the regular chairs that are in there are god awful plastic things that 10 minutes into it, I'd be a train wreck. So those kinds of things are sort of, to me, also within that realm of, of body work, because you're doing that, <clears throat> that awareness of what your needs are to keep that load low from day to day. Right. Yep. This takes an incredible amount of self-awareness, I will say. And, it does, and you know, yeah. how how yeah. often, I mean, if we had money, Dana, if we were paid mm -hmm. for every time we use the word self-awareness. Yeah. Can um, we do that? You will know, someone pay us for that? That'd be great. Will someone, I thought, we still haven't gotten our Diet Coke sponsorship. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm just putting that back out there. But, um, <laughs> you know, manifest, manifest. You know, uh, to be able to be aware of how you're feeling, what you need, how to reduce, um, how to make things predictable, how to make things routinized so that that doesn't cause yeah. any water to add, be added to your bucket. If anything, it it keeps things low. I mean, we talked about sleep yeah. and how important, you know, sleep is a big factor in not yeah. overfilling a bucket um, or keeping that bucket low. So there's, lot, there's lots of things, yeah. but, you know, I, I just, I, I think for me as I'm working, that's like, I see this day in and day out in my work, in my clinical work, which is how do we address this neurological thing mm -hmm. that's happening yeah. in a way that is not threatening? Because it's like, oh, if I'm already so sensitized to even go out there, thinking about doing mm -hmm. a treatment or an intervention. Yeah. Yeah. How do I get over that hurdle, right? It's a lot. Exactly. It's yeah. a lot. Yeah. The other thing that comes to mind with me when you're talking about that is when you're going into a novel setting, like if you start a new job or uh, yeah. you're going to a new school, you know you're going to, it's going to be a ton of water in your bucket, but knowing that if you do it repeatedly enough, it'll become routine. Yeah. Um, sort of like we went to that arena this weekend for that basketball and they have redone the arena since we were there last time. So we didn't know where we were going. And there was that, I was aware of that, like added, oh my God, that's not in the background now. Cause we're like, how do we get to our seats? Whereas normally that would be in the background. And that's sort of like what it is for work. If you go every day and you have that same routine, you're not having to think about it anymore. And now it doesn't add water to your bucket, but if it's brand new, it's going to overflow it for a while for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, do you know what I, what I like is that because you know yourself mm -hmm. and you know what the quote unquote cost is yeah. to go yeah. to an event because you want to go to the event because you yeah, enjoy that. Yeah. You can plan. Yeah. Yeah. You can plan, yeah. Yeah, you exactly. can plan before and after. So that's yeah. another thing we forget is that we don't, don't just look at the, the cost of the demand, look at how long it will take for rest and recovery. Cause what that's another thing. Do? What are little kids do where they're just getting dragged from here to there and they have no efficacy. It's no wonder they're It's no wonder we have, suffering. we have meltdowns, not tantrums. Yes. We have meltdowns. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Those are, those are oh. meltdowns and those happen for, you know, you don't, I mean, meltdowns aren't just for the, the neurodiverse, like neurodiverse, the yeah, neurodiverse community, true. right? Like yeah. it's not like you can get meltdowns with yeah. kids because yeah. they're kids and their systems are quite young yeah. still. That's right. Uh, yeah. And they have no cognitive resourcing <laughs> for yeah. anything. Or control over anything. They can't say we have to leave now. Well, they can, but, you know, doesn't they can, but work. they're kids like who listens to them? Yeah. Like, oh, be quiet and go play. I don't know. Like, so, yeah. I mean, that happens. And so, you know, overwhelm, you guys, meltdowns, you can have a meltdown as an adult. Oh, sure. I have meltdowns all the time. And my neurotypical wife once in a while has a meltdown. Right. Totally get it. Melt yeah. down. We yep. can do that because we are completely overwhelmed by our situation, our environments and what is happening. 
Uh, right. We're not trying to, you know, volitionally do harm to ourselves. Anyway, or That's to right. others, right? That's right. Um, yeah. On that note. <laughs> on That's that a good note, note to end on. Yeah. Don't hurt yeah. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Don't yeah. hurt yourself and don't hurt others. Like, yeah. as Dana yeah. says, be good to you. Be, be good to you. Be good to you. Be yeah. good to you. All right, everyone. All right, Marvels. We'll uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye, everybody.